Okay, good afternoon. Today's shir is Leila Nishmas, William and Helen, Rochel Bas Yosef, David ben Avraham, Tzvi Dov ben Chaim Pesach, Fred ben Richard, Yitzchak ben Sarah, Devorah Bas Yitzchak, Avraham ben Mordechai David, Reuven ben Shmuel, Shoshana bas Alchanan, Yeshua ben Shmuel, Chana Golda bas Yisrael, Chaim ben Fege, Yaakov ben Yitzchak, Mordechai Netzach ben Rivka, Rochel bas Yosef, Eliezer ben Yaakov, Chaim ben Gedalia, Mordechai Netzach ben Rivka, Zalman Leib ben Moshe, Chaim Elio ben Yosef Moshe, Ami Chai ben Yaakov, Gedalia ben Tzvi Ruvein, Leila Nishmatam. Today we're going to do the, the Aftorah and the Parsha. This Shabbos is going to be a special Shabbat because it's Shabbat Shira. And it's also a Tov B'Shvat. So Shabbat Shira, take a bird to lunch. Or have a bird for lunch. <laughs> now, why are you supposed to feed the birds for? Hmm? Why are you supposed to be what? Oh, why are you supposed first to? Uh, so anyway, uh, there's a minak to feed the birds this Shabbat because Hakorat Tatov. Where did the Jews know to sing to God? How did the Jews know that God appreciates when we sing to Him? He heard the birds. The birds are always singing to God. So Hakora Tatov to the birds, therefore, there's a minach to feed the birds this Shabbat. When? Who said before Shabbat? Golda. So Golda is right. She said before Shabbat. Why? Because on Shabbat, you know, you cannot sit down to lunch unless you feed your animals first. You know, great tzaddikim would buy a pet. Why would they buy a pet? to do the mitzvah. You can't eat uh, breakfast, lunch, or dinner unless you feed, what, Fido, or Felix the cat, right? So it's a mitzvah to feed your own animals on Shabbos or Wednesday before you eat. But animals that do not depend on you for their sustenance, wild animals or wild birds, Chazal say it's muktza. You should not feed animals that don't belong to you on Shabbat. It's muktza, it's a uvda de chol, it's an extra bother. In Shabbos, you're not supposed to exert yourself. But, says the Orech HaShulchan Golda, the Orech HaShulchan says something incredible. He was a great posek. Now, he's a das yochid. All the other posek can say, like Golda said, should put the, the, the food out Friday afternoon. Unless they're your own birds, then you have to feed them yourself before Shabbos, before you eat. But if they're wild birds, you're not allowed to feed them on Shabbos, like any wild animals, because it's muktzah. But, says the Orech HaShulchan, Shabbat Shira, this coming Shabbos, chitin l'ofot b'Shabbat, you're permitted even to feed the birds on Shabbos. Minag Yisrael Torah. Minag Yisrael Torah, what does that mean? A custom of Israel is Torah. Sha'ofot omrim shira. Since the birds taught us to sing to Hashem, therefore, anachtu makil lehem tova. We have to express gratitude to them. Kedei liskor simchat shirat hayam. Zeh l'shem mitzvah umutar. So he says that this Shabbos is different. Normally in a regular Shabbos you can't feed wild birds. But this Shabbos says the Orach HaShulchan. He had very wide shoulders, Golda. And he says, Minak Yisrael Torah, the principle of HaKoros HaTov is so powerful of expressing gratitude that even on Shabbos itself, the rabbis will wave away there is some muktzah just this Shabbos to feed the birds on Shabbos to express HaKoros HaTov. Okay? Now let me ask you, Sarah, does the, the bird know why we're giving it food? Did he know that his great 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 grandpappy taught us how to sing to Hashem? No, no. What difference is to the birds? What we they don't know why we're feeding them, do they? No, no. So Akara Satovra Baruch is not for the birds. It's for the birds. Not for it's for me. Right. For my Nishama to receive its tikkun, her tikkun, for my Shlemutanefesh, I have to express a gratitude. It's not for the birds. It's for the birds. It's not for the birds. My Nishama needs that tikkun to express gratitude. To fix my soul for eternity, I have to express gratitude. And that principle is so great, says the Orach HaShulchan, that on this Shabbos, as opposed to other Shabbos, you are permitted, even on Shabbos itself, to what? Feed the birds in order to express HaKor HaSatov 
Because without them, we wouldn't know that God loves to be serenaded. They're constantly serenading to Hashem, right? So we learned from them. So therefore, this Shabbos, other Polskim don't agree with Nachum. Other Polskim agree with Golda. Okay, but he had very wide shoulders, and he says, if you forget to put out the, bur the, the food Friday afternoon, even on Shabbos itself, just this Shabbos alone, you are permitted to feed the birds to express HaKorah Tatov. So says the Orach HaShulchan, yes? Yes. That you're not allowed to throw bread out in uh, Jerusalem. You have to save it for the birds. Is that true? You're not allowed to throw bread. You're not allowed to throw any food out. I mean, uh, yeah, but you, know, yeah, you can't just throw it out. If you want to throw out food, you should put it in a plastic bag. Bag it. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Bag it and put it in the garbage can. You're not obligated to feed birds, but this Shabbos is the exception. You're obligated to feed your own animals before you even eat. You're not obligated to feed any strange animals. But this Shabbos is the exception where to express a chorus at all for teaching us to sing to Hashem, Chazal made a takana that we should feed the birds. And if you can't do it on Friday, the Orach HaShulchan says even what? On Shabbos. But just this Shabbos alone. What? Her question was a little different. What was her question? She was told that you shouldn't throw bread out, you should leave it outside for the birds. It's not true. If you want to throw bread out, you don't throw it out, but you wrap it in a plastic bag and you can put it in the garbage. You don't throw it like this plain, it's a bazillion for the ochel, but in a bag, in the garbage can is fine. You want to feed the birds? With it? You, feed the birds you can feed the birds any day of the week, but the mitzvah is only when on Shabbos Shira, this coming Shabbos. So, this Shabbos is Tu B'Shvat, so besides taking a bird to lunch or having one for lunch, hug a tree. Uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, we'll talk about that. But first, let's get to the Aftorah. The Aftorah we're going to read this Shabbos is about Devorah. Eshet Lapidot. What does Devorah mean? A bee. Bzz, 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 bzz. Why is this great prophet lady, why is she called after an insect? Isn't that strange? A, a non kosher insect. Devora Isha Nevia. She was a great prophet, a judge in Israel. Isn't it strange to call her B? What? With the retort to her husband, she stung him. Ah, who said Muhammad Ali? I sting like a bee. I sting like a bee. So, it's a good question, no? You would think, you know, what's in a name? You know, why does this great Sadek is Nevia have a name after an unclean insect? I'll tell you why. A bee stings, but it also gives honey. So she stung the PLO. She stung Abu Mamzer and company. But she gave honey for us. That's why she's called Devorah. She stung the enemy of Israel, as we'll see soon. She stung the enemy of Israel, the Canaanites, the terrorists, but she's sweet as honey for Am Yisrael. That's why she's called Devorah. Eshet Lapidot. Now, Eshet Lapidot literally means a fiery lady. Eshet Lapidot. Not the iron lady, the fiery lady. But actually, Eshet Lapidot means the wife of Mrs. Lapidus. Now, she was married to Barak Lapidot. Barak, the general, was her husband. And his name was also a Lapidus, like... Barak Lapidus, Mr. and Mrs. Lapidot, okay? But Eshet Lapidot also means the fiery lady, this Devora. Now, she was much greater than her husband because her husband was a general. Husband was no Novi, but she was what? A Novi. So we find many cases that what? That the woman is much greater than what? Than, uh, than the husband. We find that many times. Many times, right? Refract all the, all the mothers. Chazal say that all the mothers, the mamas, the papas, Chazal say that the mamas of Israel were much greater than the papas. I agree. Okay, they all say that. <laughs> but anyway, let's move on over here. All right? So here, the Jews are being terrorized. Instead of Abu Mamzer in the, in the Torah, we're going to read Shabbos, they're terrorized by the Canaanites. A skunk by any other name, still a skunk. Whether it's Abu Mamzer or whether it's what, Sisera, Right? Or Arafat, the rat. You know, a skunk by any other name. The Jews are being terrorized. Okay? So Devorah tells her husband Barak to mobilize an army. 
to go fight the enemies of Israel. Okay? Now, very strange. So Barak mobilizes Zvulin and Naphtali and, uh, and the Navi seems to throw in something from left field. The Navi says over here, the Hever Hakeni Nifrat Mikayin Menechova. In the middle of the story where Barak and Devorah are mobilizing an army to what? Go fight Abu Mamzer and friends. The Navi from left field, you'll see tomorrow morning, I'm Shabbos morning, the Hever Hakeni Nifrat Mikayin, the Olad Elon. One morning, Hever wakes up. It's a popular name, he was a Hever. He says, honey, let's move. Let's move. Calls you all, let's move. Why is that important? He moves. He moves from where he lived, and you know where he moves? He moves where the battle of Barak and Sisera will take place. That's where he moves, puts his tent there. And who's going to flee there after the battle? Sisera. 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 Who's going to get excited and headache over there? Sisera. So look how God works in mysterious ways, Masha. Look incredible. The Grand Master. Why did Hever say, listen, I want to move. I don't like, all of a sudden he doesn't like the neighbors. He moves. And where does he move? In this place where in a short while the battle will take place between, between Barak what, and Sisra. Sisra will run there to hide in the tent and uh, she will make him a head shorter. But the point that the Navi is making, that nothing happens by Mikre. You get a, a bee in your bonnet. You want to move to this neighborhood. Right. Who put that machshav in your head? God, you don't think so. But the great manipulator. There's a reason why you have to move. Now sometimes you won't see it until 80 years later. Here you saw it in a few weeks later. But the point that the Navi is making, that there's a great grand master. We think we're moving on our own. But... A, a chess master controls the game. So he had Hever and Yael move to this location where this battle will take place in a short while. Okay? So the Novi gets that out of the way. Okay? So what happens? Uh, so they're totally defeated. It's a miracle on a par of the splitting of the Red Sea. Just like in the Red Sea, there were 600 chariots drowned in the uh, Red Sea. Over here, how many chariots were there? Not 600 Yehuda, but how many? 900. The miracle is even greater. 900 chariots were stuck in the uh, in Nachal Kishon, and a great miracle took place. A rain. Ray, a rain, lightning, very similar to what? To the splitting of the Red Sea. About two centuries later, Connie. Okay? So, the entire army is destroyed. The Canaanites are the, the only survivor was Arafat, I mean Sisera. Sisera. So he gets off his chariot and he runs to hide, guess where? In the tent of Yael Eshes Hever Akeni, who just moved there a few weeks ago. Gee, Kawiki Dinky. I don't think so. So she's there. And the husband happens to be not home. Because if the husband were home, well, she wouldn't make him a head shorter, right? So the husband was away, business trip at the office. So she's there, and she says to him, come hide in my tent. I'll protect you from the IDF, okay? So he hides over there, he hides over there, yeah. And, uh, he wants water, but instead of water, she gives him what? Hot milk. He, he, right, she puts him to sleep, she covers him up, and then she takes the tent peg from the tent, and she smashes him in the face. I think she gives him a sudden headache number nine. Number nine. We're going to get there, we're going to get there. Okay, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. She smashed him in... She smashed him through with the tent peg and she killed him. And she killed him. So that's the story. Then after that, just like in the Parsha, Moses sings a song. 
Here, Devorah and Barak also sing a song of what? To HaKadosh Baruch Hu, a song of praise. Just like at the Red Sea, the Jews sang after the great miracle, here also they sing a song of praise to Hashem. So Devorah sings a praise to Hashem, and she also praises Yael. And she says, B'mei Shamgar ben Anat b'mei Yael. So the Talmud says, just like Shamgar, the funeral parlor is named after this judge, Shamgar. But the same verse where it mentions Shamgar being a shofate, it mentions that Yael was also a judge. So people don't know. Devora was not the only female judge. Yael was also a shofetet. Our lady rabbis kosher. I don't know about that, but it looks like lady judges were kosher. 3,000 years ago, lady uh, shofet, you had Devora and you had Yael. So Devora sings a praise to God, and she's also singing a praise to Yael. And she says something amazing. Tevorach menoshim Yael. Blessed among all women is Yael, Eishes Hever Akeni, the wife of Mr. Hever. Menoshim boil to She's more blessed than all the women. Now, now we get to the sticky part. In the Shira. Before she gave him an excedrin headache, the, the Pasuk says, Bain Ragleha Kora. Between her legs he knelt. Nafal, he fell. Shachav. Shachav means an act of intimacy. Shachav Bain Ragleha. He did the sex act, Bain Ragleha, between her legs. That's what the Navi says. You could look it up in the, in the tomorrow's Haftorah. In tomorrow's reading in the Torah, Judges 5, verse 27, Bein Ragleo Kora, between her legs he knelt, Nafal he fell, Shachav. Shachav means the act of intimacy in, 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 in Biblical Hebrew. Bein Ragleo, again, Kora, Nafal, Basha Kora. So the Talmud learns from this that she seduced them multiple times. She's this married woman, Yael, a judge of Israel, seduced Arafat more than once in order to tucker him out to be able to give him an excedent headache number 99. And instead of being condemned for committing adultery, Devorah is what? Praising her. Praising her. Which is very problematic because we know there are three cardinal sins that you cannot if your life is in danger, you're supposed to transgress the whole Torah, except three cardinal sins, and one of them is what? Adultery. Adultery. So here, not only did she not uh, refuse him, she's the one that seduced him. And yet, instead of being condemned, she what? She's praised. It's very problematic, very problematic. This is a judge of Israel, Elisheva. Now, the bottom line is that after she did this, she could no longer live with her husband. That's the bottom line. She could no longer live with her husband. Okay? If a woman commits adultery voluntarily, if she's raped, Loyalenu, if the husband's not a Cohen, then she can remain with him. But here, she wasn't raped. She's the one that seduced him. So the bottom line is that they cannot live together. He must divorce her. But the question is, how could this righteous judge do an act like this? So the Talmud in Nozir, page 3, makes a very bizarre statement. Gidola avera lishma mi mitzvah shelo lishma. Rabbi can you understand this? I don't. Nozir, page 3. Gidola avera lishma. It is greater to commit an avera for her sake than a mitzvah not for her sake. I'll explain. Okay? It's great to do mitzvot, right? Even, f even for selfish reasons. But that's far from being the highest, you know. You should do mitzvot lishma for her sake. Who's the her? The shechina. So the Talmud says, if you do an avera lishma, which means by doing this act, she rescued the Jewish people. Because if Arafat would escape, he was an evil genius. He'd come back with even more terrorists to terrorize Israel. So she did in a very small, she knew she could not, um, you know, give him an exceptional headache unless he fell asleep. And he wouldn't fall asleep unless they had multiple uh, 
sexual relationships, to tucker him out. You shouldn't give him no Viagra, you know, she tuckered him out, and then she was able to out, smash his skull. So that's called an Avera Lishma. Don't try this at home. <laughs> that's called an Avera Lishma. When the destiny of the Jewish people is at stake, Connie. Remember, this evil genius would escape. He was Arafat plus Hitler all rolled into one. He would come back with even more terrorists to terrorize the Yidden. So she sacrificed her spirituality, knowing that she could no longer be with her husband. And for all she knew, maybe she's losing her Olam Haba. She's a married woman committing adultery, but she did it to save the Jewish people. So therefore, instead of condemning her, Devorah praises her. Like Esther. Very similar to Esther. In fact, the Talmud compares Esther. Esther also went to the king voluntarily. After a while, she, she went to the king voluntarily. Very similar to Esther. When the Jewish people, national survival is at stake, then an Avera Lishma can what? Be even greater than Mitzvah Shalol Lishma. So therefore, Esther and, and uh, Yael are unique in this case. But the bottom line is that Esther could no longer go back to Mordechai either, because right. Mordechai was her husband, and Mr. Hever lost a, a, a Tzadikus. They could no longer be married anymore. But this is called an Avera Lishma, and therefore what? The Navi praises her. Okay? So, then there's a strange verse here. Oror Meroz, Omer Malach Hashem. Cursed is the place called Meroz. Devora, she curses this place called Meroz. In, uh, you look it up tomorrow in Shabbos when you get to Shul, Judges chapter 5, Pasuk, Pasuk 23. Or Meroz, Omer Hashem. Cursed is this place called Meroz. Mem Reish Vav Zion. Cursed are our inhabitants because they didn't come to help God. They didn't come to help God. Does God need any help? What do you mean they didn't come to help God? She's cursing this place called Meroz. And all of her inhabitants she's cursing because they didn't come to help God. So Rashi says, does God need any help? So Rashi says, anyone who helps the Jewish people is considered what? Helping God. So they didn't come to help God, therefore she curses them and their inhabitants. Now, where is this place, Moroz? So, I hope you're fastening your seatbelts. The Zohar says that this place, Meroz, happens to be the red planet, Mars. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. That, therefore, there are traces of life on Mars. Because, according to the Zohar, before I put a spell on you, before Devorah put a spell, in other words, these are my favorite Martians, these Martians had the capability to help the Jewish people against the terrorists. Since they didn't, they had the ability to help the Jewish people, and they didn't, they gave up their right to exist, and therefore Devorah cursed them out of existence. So says the Zohar in Shoftim, chapter 5, verse 23, Or Meroz cursed out these people from the planet Mars because they didn't come to help the Jewish people. So they had the capabilities to help the Jewish people, and they didn't. The whole universe is created only for Am Yisrael. That's why we're so hated, because the nations know that, right? It all is all about us. So it's true, the whole world revolves around us. So according to the Zohar, this is in the planet Mars. Therefore, there are traces of life on Mars, because there was Mars until Devora curse them out of existence. This is in Judges 5, Pasuk uh, 23, that's going to be, that's going to be Shabbos morning's uh, Haftorah. So now let's get to the Parsha. Parsha's Bashalach. He Bashalach paroy at Am. When Pharaoh let the people go. So it says Vayihi. The Talmud Megillah says there are two ways to say and it was. Vayihi and Vahaya. In Hebrew, there are two ways to say, and it was. You can say, Vayihi, and you can say, Vahaya. What's the difference? 
So Talmud says, the Hayas Loshin Simcha, and Vayhi is Loshin Tsar. So what's the Tsar over here? The Jewish people are finally let go after 210 years in slavery. It should say, the Haya, the Shalach Paratam. How come it says Vayhi, which is Loshin Tsar? So Gemara Megillah 14 says, God says, Vayhi, Vay, Vay. After all the miracles I did for the Jewish people, who am they giving credit to? Bishalach Parai at the Om. Parai let the people go. Hashem says, Fashtop the cup, where's your gratitude? Who set you free? So therefore, it's Vayahi and not Vahaya. It's Loshin Vai Vai. I think the Jews were suffering from this Patty Hearst syndrome. Anybody know what that is? Well, after 210 years, of captivity, they began to identify like Patty Hearst did, to identify and sympathize with the captors. So the Jews suffered from this Patty Hearst syndrome, and therefore, HaKadosh Baruch Hu didn't say Vahaya, which is Lashen Simcha, he said what? Vayahi Lashen Tsar, because the Jews gave credit to Paro. So Moshe took the bones of Joseph with him. Now even though it was a mitzvah to take the gold, Moshe ignored the mitzvah and he went to take the bones. So last week I said, why? Because Akara Tatov. Remember I said Akara Tatov comes before God commanded to take the jewelry. But Moshe felt that he owes Yosef a debt of gratitude because he's a grandson of Levi and Levi was the instigator to sell Joseph. So Levi's debt of gratitude to Joseph was the greatest, and therefore Moshe ignored the command to take the jewelry, and he took the bones of Joseph, being a grandson of Levi, because HaKorah Tatov. That's what I said last week. Yeah. But Masha said something incredible. Masha was mechavein to the Talmud. The Talmud in Psachim, make my day, Masha, quotes a pasuk in Mishlei 10. When Yosef went for the bones, when Moshe went for the bones of Joseph, the Talmud of Sochen quotes a posuk in Mishlei 10, Chacham Lev Yikak Mitzvot. The Jews went for the jewelry. Moshe went for the bones, and the Talmud of Sochen quotes Mishlei 10, Chacham Lev, what does Chacham Lev mean? Wise. The wise-hearted Yikak Mitzvot takes mitzvot, Referring to whom? Moshe Rabbeinu, because he went, what? For the bones. So the question is, it should have said, Yikach Mitzvah, Reb Nochem. He went for the bone, take the body, that's Mitzvah. How come the Talmud says that Moshe Rabbeinu is a Chacham Lev Yikach Mitzvot? Mitzvot is what? Two. Two. Well, it looks like he only took one. So Masha gave the answer. Because the Egyptians would bury their pharaohs with loads of jewelry. Remember King Tut's tomb? So therefore, Chacham Lev Yikach Mitzvot. Yikach Mitzvot, not Mitzvah. Because in the coffin with Brother Joe, like in the coffin of King Tut, Chanoch was what? Jewelry. jewelry, a lot of diamond tennis bracelets. Go for the gold. So Masha was mechavin to the Gemara. There, it's a posuk in Mishlei 10, Chacham Leib, Yikach Mitzvot, not Mitzvah, Mitzvot. Because by taking the coffin, Yochan, what's inside King Tut's coffin? A lot of gold and jewelry. And, and Joseph was a great pharaoh. So therefore, Moshe didn't lose. He was a Chacham Leib Yehuda. He didn't take a Mitzvah. He took what? Plural, mitzvot. He got the gold as well. He got the gold as well. Very interesting, right? Now, uh, Shabbos morning reading, Moshe took the bones of Joseph with him, and because Joseph made the brothers swear, when God remembers you and brings you back to Pisgat Zev, I mean to Ashkelon, I mean to Rechavia, take my bones up with you. What's this all about bones? Make no bones about it. I mean, what's it? The Pasuk says, Moshe took 
the bones of Joseph with him. You have the word bones. And then the Pesach says, because Joseph made the brother swear, when you, God remembers you, bring up my bones with you. What's this all about bones, Beryl? No, make no bones about it. I mean, what's this? Um, well, well, he took the bones in order to... But what bones? What, he was still alive. Joseph was still alive, and he told his brothers, bring up my bones. And Moshe took the bones. What's this all about bones? And it gets even more weird. On Pesach night, when you eat the lamb chop, on the Korban Pesach, there's a mitzvah not to break. Not to break, not not to break it. What's this all about bones, Chanoch? Yeah. This is state and I talk, if I ever heard it. You can't say the same thing every year. You can't just read the Haggadah Baruch. Yeah. What's this all about bones? Joseph's bones, and again the bones, and break no bones for the Korban Pesach. The answer is, we have to have a backbone, like Yosef at Tzadik, to stand up to Mrs. Poitifar how she tried to seduce him. We have to have a backbones to withstand the test of life, whether it's Aishas Potiphar or not to take the come against the brothers. The brothers did him so dirty, so dirty, and yet he was, did he take revenge? It's only natural. He was so kind to them. So he displayed what, Rav Nochem? Backbone. That's what Pesach is all about. Show me what you're made of. We have to have a backbone to stand up. When the going gets tough, the tough go shopping. I mean the tough get going. <laughs> we have to have a backbone. And that's the holiday of Pesach. That even though we were a mem teshari tumare baruch, we didn't change our names. Right? We didn't change our dress. And we didn't change what our language. We still had the backbone and that's what kept us Jewish despite all. So that's the message that the Torah is what is conveying over here. That's the message the Torah is conveying over here. Very interesting. The beginning of the parsha, the Jews are trapped. The Red Sea and the mighty Egyptian army is bearing down on them. Now, it says they left with, with weapons. Vahib Shalapar, the Jews left armed. There were 600,000 able-bodied men. And yet the Torah says, Hashem yelochem lechem, atem tachrishim. God will fight for you, don't fire a bullet. There were 600,000 armed men trapped by the Red Sea. God commands them, Hashem yelochem lechem. God will fight for you, you remain what? Passive. But at the end of the Pasha of Nochem, when the Amalekites attack, when the Amalekites dare to remain passive? No, Moshe Rabbeinu sends out an army of IDF, and we have to fight. So what's it all about? What's the difference? Why against Egypt, the same weapons, the same army, God says, stand back, God will fight for you? And the end of the Pasha, the Amalekite attack, God says what? Moshe says, go out and defend yourself. Makara, what's the difference? A good question, no? And more important, what's the difference for us in the year 2017? Because we know the Torah is not history, history book. book. What's the message? Yeah, Go ahead. Uh, what? He made, he made his move before Hashem actually rescued. Who made the move first? Why did God say, don't fight at the Red Sea? Hashem yelochem lechem. But at the end of the parsha. There, no, there we have to take the fight to Arafat. What's the difference? Because Go ahead. The Egyptians, Hashem wanted us to, to know that it was Hashem that took us out of Egypt. No. So in this, that case... And Amalek? Wasn't out of Egypt, was it? No, but what's the difference? Arafat or Abu Mamzer? I mean, an enemy is an enemy. What's the difference, Connie? So the Evan Ezra asked this question. And he says something incredible. He says... What I said before, the Jews suffered from the Patty Hearst Syndrome. They were not capable of fighting their former slave masters. They had this mental block. 210 years they were captives in Egypt. The Egyptians fed them and kept them alive. So they felt this strange, uh, whatever it's called, 
connection. They had this mental block, says Evan Ezra, they couldn't defend themselves. A mental block. The slave mentality, call it the Patty Hearst syndrome. They couldn't do it, so God says, I have to do it. But against Amalek, we were not captives against Amalek. So therefore, against Amalek, we have to fight. We have to fight. God only helps those who help themselves. And this is such a powerful idea. At the end of the parsha, Moshe doesn't go to fight. He sends Yeshua, right? Mikimia. He sends Yeshua. So Moshe gets on top of the mountain and he lifts up his hands, right? He doesn't have magic hands, but when his hands are up, it's a signal, focus on the one above, right? And we put his hands down, we broke concentration, right? Moshe's hands became heavy. So he had to have help. His brother Aaron and his nephew Hur had to what? Hold up his, look at the humiliating sight. This great prophet of God has to have his hands supported by Aaron and Hur. Why did Moshe suffer such an humiliation? Now if Rashi wouldn't say it, Ramachim, I couldn't say it. I'll read you what Rashi says. Bishvil shen is atzel b'mitzvah, because Moshe was lazy in the mitzvah. Umina achar tachtov, and he appointed Yeshua in his place to go fight Abu Mamzer. Therefore, he suffered this humiliation. What? Moshe Rabbeinu, the chief rabbi of Israel, so he appointed Yeshua Benun to go fight in the IDF. He didn't go himself. Moshe super Haredi. So the Torah punishes him. His hands become heavy because he was lazy. He did not do the mitzvah. Which mitzvah did he not do? To fight in the IDF. The uh, Baba Rebbe said, anyone who joins the IDF is doing Melchemet Mitzvah 24-7. Baba Rebbe was Haredi. Anyone who joins the IDF does Melchemet Mitzvah 24-7. But some people just don't get it. They go demonstrate in Bar Ilan and burn garbage cans. Sickos, sickos. And this is current events in the Torah. Current events, doesn't, and I'm telling you, I couldn't make this up. Last night, these Haredim and block Bar Ilan streets, they burn garbage cans, they stone policemen because they don't want to go to the army. But the Torah says in this week's Pasha Rabbaruch that Moshe Rabbeinu, you need more Haredi than him, was punished because he didn't go to fight himself. He appointed Yeshua ben Nun himself. Therefore, he was punished that he couldn't even keep up his hands. Current events, Rav Hanoch, it's incredible. I couldn't make how How the Pasha of the week, Benish speaks to what? Every... Uh, 50 people, how many were arrested? They don't want to go to the IDF. Why don't you learn Rashi? You're Haredi. Who's more Haredi than Rashi, Connie? But no. Some people say, don't confuse me with the facts. My mind is made up. I mean, you couldn't, you have to be blind not to see how the Pasha speaks to current events. Moshe Rabbeinu was lazy in the mitzvah. Rashi says it quoting Chazal, and he appointed someone else to go fight for him. Therefore, he was punished. Police so, 48 or in their anti-Jeff protests. Now, isn't that incredible, Rabbi Baruch? Now, Moshe Rabbeinu thought, perhaps, joining the IDF is a mitzvah like making Kiddush. Do I have to make Kiddush myself? Do I have to blow Shoifer myself? No. Do I have to make Abdullah myself? No. I can appoint a Shliach. Moshe ben you thought that you can join the IDF through a shliach, Yeshua. But God said, no. Joining the IDF is a mitzvah like putting on tefillin. Can I make you a baruch tomorrow morning? Do me a favor, put on tefillin for me. No. Doesn't work. No. So the Torah is telling us that joining the IDF is a mechemet mitzvah like putting on tefillin. You can't make a shliach. And because Moshe didn't do it, Nisatzel, Rashi uses a strong language. Who knows Hebrew here? Nitatzel be mitzvah. Atzlut in Hebrew is what? Lazy. Lazy. Nitatzel be mitzvah. Atzlut in Hebrew. 
and he appointed someone else. That you couldn't get more current events than this. It's just frightening how the Pasha of the week always speaks to, to, to current events. But just amazing. There are none so blind that what? These Haredim are in denial. Together with Pero. They're in denial. Get it? In denial. <coughs> in denial. Unbelievable. The Pasha of the week, right? So, Yeshua Benun went to fight. He didn't destroy them all. He didn't destroy them all. He didn't destroy them all. Unlike the victory over Paroi, which was complete, this victory over Amalek and Abu Mamzer is not complete. We're still fighting the enemy 3,329 years later. Until, until Mashiach comes. Until Mashiach comes. Now, the Jews are at the height of euphoria. They're singing Shirat Ayam, they just saw the greatest miracles. Right? And the singing, all the Jews were Nevi'im, even a lowly maidservant became a greater Navi at the Red Sea than whom? Yechezkel. A lowly maidservant became a greater prophet at the Red Sea than Yechezkel. By the sea, by the sea, by the... They're all singing, they're in heights of euphoria and ecstasy. Right? What happens? Three days later, three days later, what happens? The euphoria, the euphoria evaporates and they come to a place called Mara. And they couldn't drink the water because? Bitter. What was bitter? No, I never bitter. tasted bitter water, did you? They were bitter. Says the Baal Shem Tov, Rabbi Abraham. They couldn't drink the water because they were bitter. Now before Zygmunt Freud, the Baal Shem Tov said that a person that's depressed you give him sweet ice cream to eat, it'll taste bitter. So before Sigmund Freud, the Bashem Tov said, water has no taste. The water tasted bitter because they were bitter. And since they were bitter, the water tasted bitter. Makara! Three days ago, Reb Nochem, you were what? The heights of ecstasy, euphoria. Three days later, you become bitter. That's life, riding high in April, shot down in May. <laughs> Connie, that's life. That's the message of the Torah. It's not always going to be black and white, victory singing at the Red Sea. There'll be never plenty Mora Loyaleinu and plenty Amalek terror attack. That's the way this world is, a roller coaster. A wild roller coaster with ups and downs. So the Jews have to, from the get go, they have to know this. Now, this Pasha is always read to Bishvat, always. Says the Ramban, what's the remez? So the water is bitter. So Hashem shows him what? A tree. Get it? Hashem shows him a tree and he puts the tree in the water and the water becomes what? Water doesn't become sweet, the water's not bitter. They became sweet. <laughs> Baruch, but Makala, I'm telling you, it's just incredible. A person, Leilain, who's bitter and depressed, what's his tikkun? Go hug a tree. <laughs> you're depressed, Leilain, you're bitter. Admire nature. Look at God's beautiful tree. Who said? Poems are made like fools like me, but only God can make a tree. Who said that? No, no, no. Joyce Kilner. Joyce Kilner. Fools, poems are made fools like me, but only God can make a tree. Look at the tree, the magnificent tree. Shade, oxygen, beauty, delicious fruit. If you meditate on the beauty of God's tree, you won't be bitter no more. The Torah is not history, Barbaro. The Torah is GPS, God's personal system. You're depressed? Admire God's beautiful trees. The incredible wisdom of a tree and how it spreads its roots and how it drinks the water. You know, certain plants, when it's sunny, they open up 
and then they close up. Do you know that? They turn to the sun. Excuse me, Shalom, you had a question? I'm sorry. What was your question? Why were they bitter? Bit That's life. No, when you hit, good question. You when you, oh, 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 you heard what Sarah said? You can't leave yet. You have to sit down. <laughs> Shloima, to answer your question, I will what? The Novi says, Shloima HaMelech, at his time, Ishtachas Gafno, Ishtachas Te'eno. Everything was super duper. The Jewish people were a superpower. Numero uno in everything. <coughs> Way on top. And then what happened? And then what happened to Shlomo and the kingdom? Because once you hit the top, there's no place left to go but down. That's this world, Connie. That's the message. Shlomo Melech at the Red Sea, the Jews were the heights of ecstasy. But in this world, it can't last. Once you hit the top, there's only one place to go. Down. That's human nature. You remember the song by Peggy Lee? Is that all there is? Is that all there is? Come on. What a song. When I was a little girl, she said, my father took me to the circus. Wow, a circus. And all the great acts, three ring circus. And then after the circus she said, is that all there is? Is that all there is? That's life, riding high in April, shot down in May. It can't last. Goldie, you know why not? Because this world is temporary. Says the Holy Ramchal, good times can't last because if they did, you would think that this is all there is. No, there's a whole world beyond. This is Olam HaSheker. This world is an illusion. So to remind us of that, don't get too comfortable in this world. We're not here that long. So therefore, Kodesh Baruch Hu reminds us, Reb Shalom, that the good times can't last. Because we're not here. We're only passing through. I'm a traveling man, made a lot of stops. Regardless they got that song from us. Regardless of what Woody Allen says. I'm a traveling man. We're passing through. So Mordor says to Ramchal not to get too attached to Olam Azeh, so the good times can't last. So after the euphoria of the Red Sea, they had to become bitter. Because if they remained on the high, they would think that what? That this, this is it. This ain't it. This is just the bullpen warming up. Right? Get to the right. Let's not be in a hurry to get there. You know the story. These two baseball fans. They were baseball fans for 80 years. They went to every Yankee game. And Yankel and Schmerl. 80 years. They didn't miss one Yankee game. Baseball whole life. So Schmerl feels that his time is getting close, Beryl. You hear this? So Yankel says, Schmerl, when you die, he's on his deathbed. You have to promise me. Come back and tell me if there's uh, baseball in Ganadin. You have to promise me. So Shmerel Nebuchadnezzar is on his deathbed. He dies. Three days later, guess what? Shmerel comes to Yankel in a dream. He kept his promise. The uncle says, Shmerel, Shmerel. Wow, you kept your word. What's going on in Olam Abba? He says, Yankel, I have good news and bad news for you. What do you want to hear first? The good news. Good news, there is baseball in Olam Abba. Then what's the bad news? The bad news is, Yankel, that you're pitching next. <laughs> <laughs> now pitching for the New York Yankees. Get it? Good news and bad news, right? But anyway, this is a powerful message of the Torah. Now, he, so the Torah is not history, it's GPS, God's personal system, so the great Nachmanides, if a person feels that he's bitter, let him admire God's beautiful trees. The wonder of trees. The shade, the oxygen that it gives. The way it opens up to Shemayim, right? You know trees, there are certain trees that are 4,000 years old. You could look it up. The great redwood trees. It's a sequoia, 4,000 years old. And they're alive. Now, if you meditate on that, how can you be bitter? 
a barrel. How could you be depressed? The Torah is giving you an eight, so how to get rid of the bitterness? Concentrate on the eight, ki adam eight sasadeh. A human being is compared to what? A tree. A tree. A tree. And the, and the morale says, even the human body, the body is like a trunk of the tree and the limbs are like branches. And just like a tree needs a lot of TLC, you know, if you don't talk to your plants, they'll die. It's not a joke. You have to talk to your plants. It's not a joke. Huh? If you don't show your plants TLC, they'll wither. You don't show TLC to a human being, they'll wither. So a human being to develop properly like a tree needs a lot of tender, loving care. And just like a tree constantly gives fruit, a human being has to give fruit. What's a human being's fruit? His children, his grandchildren, his good deeds. His good deeds are his eternal, are his eternal fruit. The amazing Rashi, Ela told us Noach, Noach is tzaddik. The Torah says, these are the offspring of Noach. Noach was a righteous man. So Rashi says, the Torah goes off on a tangent. The Torah says, these are the offspring of Noach. It should have said, shame from the office. But no, it says, these are the offspring of Noach. What are his offsprings? Noach was a perfectly righteous man. But God, you promised, Ela told us Noach. You promised to name the offspring of Noach. And you don't say, shame from the office. What do you say? Noach is tzaddik tamim. So what? So Rashi says, what's going on over here? So Rashi says, the true offspring of a person are his righteous deeds. Because his human children leave him at the cemetery and go to the lawyer's office, fight over the will. But your spiritual children, your maizim taivim, they don't leave you at the cemetery. Who says you can't take it with you? Jack Benny said, if I can't take it with me, I'm not going. <laughs> but you can't take it with you. You're in mitzvahs and maizim taivim. That's the told us of a human being, the true offspring of a person. That goes with you. That doesn't stay behind in the cemetery. What a powerful lesson. Every kind word you say to somebody, every time you smile on somebody, you think it's nothing, that becomes part of your eternity. You made someone feel good. That's forever. That's forever. It hmm? doesn't cost any money to smile. It's free. If somebody's having a bad hair day and you smile on him, right. you're changing his whole day. That you take with you. That's forever. You can take it with you. Depends what. Depends what, right? So this is the, the Jews are sending the Shira. This is my God. The Anvehu says of Hirsch, and I shall become his house. Ze'eli v'anvehu, this is my God, and I will become his house. Hirsch translates like that. Others say, this is my God, and I will beautify him. But Hirsch says, Eli v'anvehu, Yehuda, this is my God, and I will, I will become his house. Now, what does that mean? Says Lubavitcher Rebbe, Leichat Tzadik of Racha. Based on Rehersh, they sing, This is my God and I shall become his house. So, to answer this question, he what? Because the Jew answers the question with? Question. Why not? <laughs> In two weeks' time, we're going to read Parshish Truma where God says, build me a mishkan made out of animal skin. The tents of the mishkan, Rebbeinish, were made out of animal skin. Why does God want a mishkan made out of animal skin? Says the Lubavitcher Rebbe, when the Jews looked at that mishkan, God's house, made out of animal skin, they remembered I've got you under my skin. 
God doesn't live in the animal skin, Mishkan. Vosali Migdash, Veshechanti, Betocham. Not Betocho. Doesn't say I'll live in the animal skin tent. Veshechanti Betocham. Where will I live? But what does Betocham mean? Betocho Echad Echad. The Mishkan was only a symbol, a reminder that God doesn't dwell in the animal skin tent. He dwells under my skin. I've got you under my skin. That's what God was. Shali Migdash, God says, build me a Migdash. The Shekhanti, not Betocho, not in the building. That's just a reminder that God dwells Betocham. Inside every one of us, that God dwells underneath my skin. That's what the Jews sang. Hmm. Pretty interesting, right? Now, let me ask you a question. On Pesach and Purim, Purim's coming up, I don't want to scare you. I don't want to scare you, right? You say Alanisim, right? We thank God and Hanukkah Alanisim for the great miracles that God did. How come on Pesach you don't say Alanisim? What am I, chopped liver? I mean, you thank God for the miracles of Hanukkah and Purim. I think the miracles that took place in Exodus of Egypt were just as great, if not greater, than what? <coughs> than Chinookah and Purim. So how come Chinookah and Purim go, they get an Alanisim, and uh, Pesach doesn't? I think it's a good question. Pesach, Pesach. How come Pesach doesn't get an Alanisim, Benish? How come Pesach doesn't get an Alanisim? What am I, chopped liver? The answer is that the Shirat Ayam is the Alanisim. <coughs> Therefore, we read Shirat Ayam and Pesach. That's the Al Hanisim. Reading the song of the sea is greater than saying Al Hanisim, Yala Purkan. That, so, but that's the punchline. Saying the Shirat Hayam, that's the Al Hanisim, therefore. Say Hal every day. But you read the Shirat Hayam, and that is the Al Hanisim, describing the great miracles that what? that the Jewish people experienced and they all sang. Now I don't understand. At the Exodus night was great miracles. They left the next morning, right? High noon. How come they didn't sing the Shira then? Why did they wait a week? Rabbi, it's a great kasha. Now my kai, Rav has this kasha. They just experienced 10 plagues. They saw Egypt destroy the superpower their former masters reduced to what? rubble. So Pesach morning they're leaving. How come they didn't sing Shira, Connie? Why did they wait the whole week? I think it's a bomb kasha. Babavram, don't you think so? Says the great Ras Halavechik. The Exodus, the ten plagues, the Exodus, it was all God's doing. We had no hand in it. We got welfare checks. If you get, keep getting welfare checks, you feel a little bit fashamed. How do you say that in English? You the fashion. The Jews didn't feel that they could sing to Hashem because they kept getting handouts. God did it all, the Exodus. Who split the Red Sea? Joint effort? If Nachshon ben Aminadov and Shevet Yehud and ben Yomim would not have dove in, the sea never would have split. So when we and God so happy together, when we and God do it, then we have a right to praise Him. You hear Rav Salvechik? The Exodus was all God. We had no input. You get welfare checks all the time. What do you do? You don't feel it. You don't feel right. But for the privilege of being involved with Hashem in splitting the Red Sea, that God allows me to contribute, wants me to contribute, for that privilege, for that privilege, I sing to Him. Right. Rasavechik takes this idea, just give me one more minute. You ever wonder, apple falls off a tree, sometimes you don't even have to pick it. What's the after, Baruch Rabbi Avraham? Chick chak burn the flushes, right? Chick chak. Bread. Alange, berchat amazon. Why don't you say a berchat amazon, an apple or an orange? Cooperative. What? It's cooperative. 
beautiful. An apple, an orange, you don't even have to pick it. Sometimes it just what? Falls off. Did you do anything? No. Nothing. It's a, a handout. So you don't feel you can praise Hashem so much because I feel like a nebbish. But it takes, how many fingers do we have? How many uh, words in the Hamotzi Bracha? Ten. Therefore, when you make Hamotzi, you put your what? Ten fingers. Ten fingers. It takes ten stages steps. to turn, ten steps, to turn the raw wheat into an angel's uh, hot roll. Now, God could have made hot rolls grow on, if God can make an orange grow on a tree, he could have made an angel's hot roll grow on tree, right? But he didn't, right? For the privilege of taking God's wheat and turning into a hot roll, it took 10 stages. So that means God wanted me to be his partner 10 times. I give him a langa benching that God loves me so much that he involves me with him in 10 stages. How much God loves me to be involved with him in Tikkun Olam. In fact, the famous Medrash, Turnus Rufus, asked Rabbi Akiva whose work is greater. Turnus Rufus, I mean Turnus Rufus. So Rabbi Akiva said, whose work is greater? Yours. Rabbi Akiva said, what? Yours. Man's work is greater. So Turnus Rufus said, what? You're a great rabbi? Yes, I'll prove it to you. You ever try eating raw wheat? <laughs> but a hot Danish. Who makes raw wheat? God. Who makes a hot Danish? We. So what's Rabbi Kiva's point? God could have made Danishes grow on trees. He can make an orange grow. But he loves us so much, he purposely left the wheat raw to give me the awesome privilege to be involved with him ten times. Who loves you, baby? For that privilege, I give a longer benching. Right? Thank you very much. Shabbat shalom.